Okay, let's get started. So I see uh, quite a few people are probably working on their um, projects, uh, but for those of you who are here, this is the last lecture of the semester, uh, and we'll be talking about um, extending some of the models that we've discussed throughout this class to um, other modalities, uh, not just text. So we'll be talking specifically about images but uh, towards the end, you'll see some examples where you can apply language models to controlling robots and um, handling like audio inputs as well and, and many other things. So um, basically, we're talking about models where the entire uh, training process includes inputs from all sorts of different modalities, not just text. And we can do all of that with uh, transformers. So, I used to give this lecture and I would focus a lot on convolutional neural networks and just uh, simple types of fusion between visual representations and image representations, but I did update it for this semester because there's been a lot of progress on this front at unifying everything into basically a single um, architecture. So first, let's uh, start with some descriptions of problems that are interesting in this space. Uh, so really, like one of the first uh, multimodal applications of vision and um, NLP was image captioning. So this task requires you to ha uh, you know, handle an image, uh, understand the semantics of that image and what's going on and the relationship between different objects in that image. Um, and then produce a caption, like a fluent natural language caption that uh, contains the meaning of the, or, or contains what's going on in that image. So here, you might uh, produce something like a red truck is parked on a street that's lined with trees. Um, and so a lot of progress was made on this task specifically. There are probably thousands of papers about this task. Uh, about you know different ways of modeling the image and the the text part. Uh, how do you combine them together? How do you evaluate? What kind of data sets do you use? Um, a ton of different different stuff was proposed. Um, and then you know uh, after a few years, people uh, started working on the separate, slightly more challenging task of visual question answering. So here, you're given an image, but you also ha could have like multiple questions about the image. And some of these questions may not be about like the main foreground objects in the image, but they could be about like the style of the image or some various subparts of the image. So as you can see here, is this truck considered vintage? So that's asking about the main object in the image. Does the road look new? So here, this is a little more complex than captioning, where in captioning you might be able to just ignore the road completely. You may not even mention it in the caption. But here, you're asked to basically ignore the truck, ignore the trees and the sky, focus just on this uh, road, and make a judgment of whether or not it's new. Um, so this is really tricky, right, because it requires in some sense, the model needs to be able to do segmentation and figure out what part of the image is the road and then try and answer this question about the road. And you can see here, similarly with the tree, right? Does the, what kind of tree is behind the truck? So there are many other tasks that involve both uh, vision and language. These are just two that have been probably the most popular in the research community uh, to this point. Um, but I'm going to just skip past other tasks and talk more about the modeling side. So we haven't talked about how you represent images at all. Uh, obviously, this class is about natural language processing. But to understand how we can actually design models for these kinds of tasks, we also need to know how images work. Um, so I'll start there and then go into some models. So we can start with the simplest type of image, a grayscale image. Um, and if you take this image on the left, you can represent this image with a single matrix where each value of this matrix, each uh, cell here represents the intensity of the pixel. Like, so 0 is black and 255 is white. And all of these uh, cells can take some value between 0 and 255. Um, and so basically, you have this matrix input. And 
uh, you're going to feed this into some sort of neural network to you know, get a representation of it that you can then use for one of these tasks like captioning or question answering. Um, so I guess I just answered this question down here. Um, but of course, like most of the images that we get on, say, the internet are not black and white, right? They're color images. So color images are actually not just matrices, but they are tensors. So if you're familiar with uh, different types of encodings for images, the most common one is RGB, right? So you represent the intensity of red, the intensity of green, and the rep uh, intensity of blue. Um, and all three of these numbers are associated with one pixel, so that allows you to represent a range of different colors. So here, in addition to the matrix that represents um, you know, each uh, location of this image, you have three different channels. That's the terminology in um, image representation. So one for each of these colors, RGB. There are many other types of encodings that you could use, but uh, we'll stick with this for now. So now you can see that the image is represented not as a matrix, but as a tensor, right? Um, so there's uh, this added dimension of the channels that you have to take into consideration. So it's very different than words, right? So with words, we start with a non-numeric representation of like, you know, the cat went to sleep, right? And then we convert that into numbers using word embeddings, right? We look up the corresponding vector for each word. Now we have a sequence of vectors and we feed that into our models. Images are a little easier to work with because the input itself is in the form of numbers already. So we don't have to do any sort of embedding lookup. We can just directly feed this uh, image into um, a neural network. So there's no process of kind of transcribing the image from its original uh, raw values into some numbers so we can operate on them. Um, and I would say that this is one reason why, uh, you know, deep learning really started with computer vision because uh, it was, you know, not challenging to figure out how to represent the, um, the inputs and feed it into the uh, neural network model. So the key operator in um, computer vision for decades, really, before the past couple years has been the convolution. Um, so if you have taken a computer vision class or a machine learning class, you've likely learned convolutions um, and how to compute them and what different kinds of convolutions. Uh, it's very straightforward, right? So let's say, for uh, instance, we just have a grayscale image here. So we have a single matrix. So a convolution essentially takes a very small window. So you can see here, this is the, called the convolutional kernel. Uh, so here it's just a three by three grid. And you're gonna take this grid and essentially slide it over the entire image. Um, so I can start here and then slide it one pixel to the right, another pixel to the right, and then once I finish this row, I can shift it down one and keep going. Um, and so what happens every time I, what, what does it mean that I slide this over the, the image? What it means that at every point in the image, I'm going to compute a very simple operation. So let's say I'm at this point in the image. I'm at this cell. So I have this kernel. What I'm going to do is just element-wise multiply each element of the kernel with the corresponding cell in this matrix. So this top left value gets multiplied with this top left value of the image. Um, the center uh, of the kernel gets multiplied by the center here, um, and so on. So I can take all these element-wise products, so I'll end up with nine products, um, and I'll just sum those. And the corresponding sum goes into the uh, cell in the resulting um, matrix that I form after doing the convolution. So it's a very simple process. Um, and, you know, you might ask, like, why are we using such a small kernel here, right? Aren't we losing a lot of information about the entire image when we just apply this local kernel at different points in the image? Um, so does anyone have any intuition on why, you know, this kernel is not the entire size of the image? Or uh, why are we using such a small kernel? Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, let's think about what an image even is, right? Like an image consists of some very low level features, right, as you said. So the things like edges or primitive shapes or colors or things like that. So if we have many different types of these kernels, each of them can specialize to kind of detecting a particular feature or a, a small set of features. So as you'll see in a bit, it's very common for certain kernels to specialize in detecting edges or types of edges or colors or even higher level objects like animals and things like that. Um, so the idea is that you know, in an image, I could have a car here, I could have a car here, I could have a car here, um, and I might want a kind of kernel that can detect a car at any point in the image, not just if it occurs somewhere in the, in the whole image. So that's kind of the intuition behind this, is that, um, you know, there's a lot of variables in what can go into an image, and there's a lot of commonalities between different images. Even if they're very different on the visual appearance, they might contain the same kinds of shapes or colors or edges, um, which can be detected at a much uh, finer grain than, than at the whole image. Okay, so just to clarify the math here, again, it's very simple. Uh, let's say we are at this uh, point in the, uh, the image, so we're centered around this value zero here at the bottom left, uh, and this is our kernel. So it's a very simple kernel. Uh, it's zero almost everywhere except here and here it's uh, one. So if we do this convolution function, we're gonna multiply zero with six, zero with seven, and all of these values will be zero, but then one multiplied by three, and one multiplied by one, so I have three plus one. The resulting value in the output is going to be four. So that's how I would slide this entire uh, kernel over every cell in this image. And you're gonna have to deal with things like uh, what happens if you're on the edge of the image, right? You might need to pad um, the image such that you can compute this operation, but um, these are things that are all very well defined, say, in PyTorch if you're applying a convolution operator. All right. So uh, this is a nice demo of, um, if it loads, uh, the different types of, uh, like, what you can do with a convolution kernel. Um, not sure why it's not loading. I did try this link like 10 minutes ago and it worked. Okay, well it appears to be streaming, so. Um, anyway, maybe I'll come back to that. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just move on. So, so basically that link has a demo where you can see uh, what happens when you apply many different kernels to a single input image. So if you ever use like Photoshop, for example, you know that there are functions that do things like uh, blur or uh, sharpen um, or other uh, kinds of things like that. Um, all of those can be implemented with a simple convolutional filter. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to sharpen an image, maybe you would put a high value on the center of the kernel and a low value everywhere else. If you wanted to blur the image, you could put basically a uniform value over all of the, the different um, elements in this kernel. And similarly, you can do pretty complicated things by just adjusting the uh, weights of a very small kernel and then sliding it over the image. Um, oh, okay, it loaded. All right, so uh, here's an image, I guess a blurry person's face. Um, and you can see here, this is a sharpen kernel. So if you use Photoshop, you can probably apply this filter. It has a very high value in the center, and then it actually um, removes information from the pixels around it. Uh, so if you apply this kernel to this picture, you can see that it does indeed sharpen the edges here um, and uh, you know, improves the, increases the contrast of, of the, the images. Um, you can try out other kernels. So, for example, Blur, as I said, uses a very uh, similar weight for every single value in this kernel, every weight in this kernel, and you can see that it becomes blurrier. Um, 
Let's see what else we have here. Uh, emboss. All right, I'm not sure what this does. Um, clearly, it does something. Uh, so yeah, if you want, you can play around with this. But um, in a traditional computer vision class, you might spend quite a bit of time experimenting with these different kernels and learning exactly how they um, they can influence the output image. All right. So now let's turn to a convolutional layer. Now that we understand this primitive function here, um, how can we incorporate this into a neural network? So you can already see that the convolution kernel itself is a form of uh, parameters to the model, right? Like if instead of setting these weights by hand to something like this, what if I had a model learn these weights so that it learned the appropriate kernels to minimize some objective function? So that's the key insight of a convolutional neural network is that you're just going to be applying the same sliding convolution function, but the kernel is actually going to be updated through backcrop. And so here um, you can see this is a convolutional layer with four filters or four different kernels, so four matrices that are like that. And each one might do something slightly different to the input image. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that, as, as you pointed out, um, one goal that we have when we have these neural networks is to reduce the dimensionality of the input, right? So in NLP, we might have some long sentence with many word vectors associated with the, the tokens in the sentence. We want to, in the end, you know, form just a single vector that we can feed into our softmax layer. So it's the same way in um, images, right? Like, let's say you're trying to do image classification. So you're trying to figure out if this is a person or an object or, uh, you know, an animal or something like that. You want to, at the end of the day, get a vector that represents the image and feed that into a softmax layer. So it's important to reduce the dimensionality of your inputs. Um, so in NLP, we have many different ways of doing that, right? We can use linear projections, we can do some sort of pooling or self-attention to get a single vector out of a, a sequence of vectors. Um, in vision, you can do many of the same things, um, but the convolution layer itself provides you a way of reducing the dimensionality of the image. So. Let's say that um, you know, I had this 224 by 224 image, uh, just a grayscale image, and I passed it through a convolutional layer with four uh, different kernels or filters. So my output now is four different versions of this image, each of which has one of those kernels applied to it. Um, but let's say that instead of sliding this uh, kernel over every single pixel, in the image, what if I skip a uh, pixel? So what if I slide it over every other pixel instead of every single pixel in the image? So if I did that, um, I would get something like this, where uh, the resulting size of these images is now a half that of the original image, right? And so I did that by setting the stride uh, property to two, which means that I'm not going to go over every single pixel, but every other pixel. So I could set this stride to say four and skip every, uh, every three out of every four pixels or set it uh, to something higher and I can reduce the dimensionality of the outputs in this way. So um, one of the very first papers on deep learning that showed the success of deep learning, I should say, is this paper called uh, AlexNet Informally. Um, it was uh, a convolutional neural network, so it, it, uh, uh, it, it basically was made up of different layers of convolutional, um, like different kernels and dimensionality reductions. And finally, you could put everything into a vector and feed it into multiple feedboard layers, like we have in, for example, fixed window language models or transformers. Um, in every block, there's a feedboard layer, right? So uh, this paper was um, uh, made a really huge impact because uh, at the time it was uh, submitted to a competition. The competition is um, called ImageNet classification, 
where you have a training data set of like a million different images and there's about a thousand classes. So you're basically trying to identify what is the main object in this image? Is it a bird? Is it a car? Is it a chair? Uh, there's a thousand of these labels. So it was a classification task and um, you submit a, you know, your test set predictions of your model to whoever was uh, running the competition and they would evaluate the uh, results. And so this was the only deep learning based uh, system submitted to this contest and it uh, like destroyed the competing models. It got I think 10 or 15 uh, percentage like absolute accuracy points improvement over the second place system. And immediately like Google went and you know, basically purchase these researchers uh, and uh, I shouldn't say that, they like purchased a company that these researchers made, uh, so effectively they, you know, um, integrated them into their company, they started uh, training their own image recognition models and everyone else followed suit and scaled up this, uh, this kind of network um, and yeah, ever since then uh, up until just a couple years ago, people have been using larger and larger convolutional neural networks to encode um, images. So this is again how this task looks. Classify an image into 1,000 possible classes. Uh, you can see some of the classes are actually quite specific. Like there are many different cat and dog breeds in uh, ImageNet. Um, there's a lot of different animals, um, but you can also see objects like banjo, barbell, hourglass, knot, uh, so on. Um, so it was 1.2 million images. And the, the rough network of AlexNet uh, basically consisted of five different convolutional um, layers. So here you can see uh, roughly the image uh, size getting broken down into smaller and smaller um, uh, matrices and finally you feed the result into these fully connected or linear layers followed by the softmax layer so basically you get a vector of a thousand dimension and you um, apply the softmax to it so you get a probability distribution over these different labels so like what could the image be okay and unlike in NLP where you know we talked about probing these models and trying to understand what each layer has learned and it was not trivial at all, right? How to, to inspect the, the neurons and the weights. In uh, computer vision, these convolutional kernels are actually much more interpretable than um, in NLP. So you have visualizations that show that, you know, the first layers of this network uh, tend to focus on edges. So they pick up different types and orientations of edges. Then as you get deeper in the network, the um, model starts detecting combinations of edges. Uh, and finally, at the top, you see more semantic uh, representations like um, you know, kernels that look for faces or uh, cars or things like that. So um, there's a nice hierarchy of uh, you know, low level to high level objects and features that are um, processed by these convolution kernels. All right, and this is not uh, you know, unfamiliar to us at this point. Uh, it turns out that adding more layers is a really good way of improving your uh, performance on image classification. So um, AlexNet was only eight layers. And you know, by 2015, we were at 152 layers. Uh, also, the residual connection that we talked about in the transformer, which was basically you know, connecting or adding the input of a layer to the output of that same layer. And we talked about how that might um, improve the gradient flow and give these shortcut connections for the gradient um, to, to uh, bypass all the complex computations in a layer, uh, that was actually invented to help scale these kinds of convolutional networks and allow them to be trained effectively. So ResNet, um, which is this uh, network with 152 layers, this was actually the first uh, network that uh, was proposed to use any, any form of residual connections. So the transformer took the, that uh, component from um, computer vision. Do you have a question?
Uh, no. So I, actually, see, I, I'm not, uh, you know, a computer vision researcher. I'm not sure what the state of the art uh, models in like commercial APIs are, but at least in research, most papers seem to have switched over to transformers, as we'll talk about um, here. So uh, perfect segue. In fact, um, so yeah, we got like these huge convolutional neural networks. Uh, but then after a while, uh, transformers totally took over in NLP, right? Transformers were introduced for the task of machine translation, which is obviously very different than image classification. But uh, the transformer also had some very nice properties regarding scaling, right? So it is uh, very parallelizable. Uh, it has this nice uh, intuition with these um, multi-heads that can look for different properties. Um, and yeah, there, there were all these like really nice code bases in PyTorch and TensorFlow that allowed you to um, you know, rapidly extend the functionality of transformers. Uh, and so people in computer vision were thinking like, can we use some of these same ideas to improve scaling in um, image processing as well. So uh, OpenAI, it turns out, is uh, you know, one of the first organizations to just go all in on transformers. And they had this uh, paper in 2020 that did probably the simplest thing that you could think of doing. So let's say you had some image. And of course, this is just a cartoon representation of the pixels in this image. Um, one thing you can do is just form a sequence out of those pixels. So you can see here that they take the top row of the image, then they take the middle row, then they take the bottom row. So you're breaking the two-dimensional structure of the image here. You're making it into this one-dimensional sequence of pixels. Um, but now that you have this sequence of pixels, it's trivial to just feed this into a transformer, right? Um, so they did that and they propose like you, you can do kind of language modeling where you predict the value of the next pixel um, or you can do like BERT style mask language modeling where you mask out some of these in the input and try and predict them. Um, but uh, this didn't really work too well. Uh, and you can think of some reasons why this is not the best way of representing an image and feeding it into a transformer. So does anyone have any ideas on why perhaps this is not ideal? So that could be true, but uh, I think you can also think about the reverse of what you just said, where let's say that I have an image where most of the image is grass, and then there's like one small bird on the grass. So if I'm doing this next pixel prediction, for many values, I could just, uh, sorry, for many positions, the next pixel will just be grass, right? The same kind of pixel. I may not need any sort of reasoning to, uh, but, but for one or a few pixels, as you say, it might be very difficult to figure out that, oh, there's a bird here, right? So um, yeah, that, that could be a challenge. Yeah, this is a great point. So here I have just, uh, you know, we've linearized this uh, image into a sequence, but how do you do the position embeddings in this case? So uh, what you can generally do is have a position for associated with each pixel in the image. So maybe this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, something like that. But it's still not ideal, right? Because um, you don't get this connection, this shortcut between position one and position four anymore. Now these are very far away because you had to throw away some element of the spatiality of this, uh, this image. Um, any other issues with this? Yeah, so this is kind of similar to what she said. I think um, the, the model can capture the vertical interactions. It's just harder to do so because 
Now, this pixel and this pixel are like three pixels apart in the sequence, right? So they're not local to each other anymore as they would be in the two-dimensional case. And the model has to learn through the position embeddings that I should look at position two, but I, I should also focus my attention a lot on position four or something like that. So it is a challenge for the model. Yeah, so you could have different encodings of the image where maybe you go vertical for one of them and horizontal for another. Uh, this might be more expensive, however, right? Because now you have potentially to pass in two different versions of the same image, but uh, I'm sure it's been tried. I'm not sure if, uh, I, I think it's probably just too expensive for, yeah. Yeah. So this is like the biggest problem with this approach by far is that so in the self-attention that we've talked about in this class, we've always focused on, okay, we have a sentence or we have a paragraph or something like that, and each word will attend to all of the other words in the input. But keep in mind right now we have a three by three image, right? So it's just a, it's a feasible length, but Let's say we have even a small image, like let's say, I don't know, 256 by 256, right? This is still a pretty small image, but the sequence length is, um, you know, huge, right? It's like 60 something thousand um, tokens potentially. And so if you go, as you say, to a high res image, this, this approach just doesn't work at all because, you know, it's quadratic in the sequence length. So if you have, you know, like a, a really large image, there's no way you can make the model attend over every single other pixel in the image. So yeah, this is the biggest problem by far, and it's, it's the main challenge that uh, researchers in this area had to solve in order to get transformers to work on um, image data. So um, it, in about uh, 2021, um, there was this very simple idea that uh, tried to get around this problem of the, the sequence length. Um, and in a way, it kind of addresses the other problems that you brought up just by um, reducing the amount of computation that is happening at any one attention um, uh, block. So let's say we have this image of a cat. And this paper is called, an image is worth 16 by 16 words. So they propose to take any image and split it into blocks of 16 by 16 chunks. Essentially, you will do self-attention. Um, so, so you'll have some representation of each block, and you'll do self-attention on those blocks rather than on the original raw pixel values. So if I have this image of a cat, I can split it into these nine different blocks. And now I'm going to independently come up with a representation for each block. So 16 by 16 is not that big, right? So 16 by 16, and let's say I have a three-dimensional, sorry, I have three channels in my image. 16 times 16 by three is 768 dimensions, which is totally feasible. So each of these blocks I can represent with a 768 um, dimensional vector. And what they propose in their paper is that I can take the 768 dimensional vector that's associated with each block. I can pass that through some feed forward layer and get it into whatever dimension I want, and then just feed that into a transformer. Um, and so this dramatically reduces the sequence length because now, uh, instead of having my original 256 by 256 image, I can chunk that into a much smaller number of these blocks and then apply a transformer over those. So here, let's say I have each of these uh, nine different patches. So they call them patches. If you read some of these papers, uh, all of them mention patch size as a hyperparameter. Um, the approaches that are state-of-the-art now are all using this method of breaking an image into patches. So I have these nine patches. Each of them are 768-dimensional um, vectors. And I will just use a feedforward layer to project them into some sort of embedding. So I could even just take the raw input, but 
since those are pixel values, they do some sort of transformation first, and they get a vector for each patch. So now, um, they add position embeddings to the patch representations. The idea is that maybe because there's a much smaller number of patches, it's easier for the model to learn the vertical and horizontal orientation of these, these patches. And they use uh, these kind of relative position embeddings that encode both the uh, vertical and horizontal orientation here. But they're basically just adding some position embeddings just like we saw in the original transformer paper. Now, um, pass this through an arbitrarily deep transformer. And at the end of the day, you get these output vectors, right, that um, are, the, in our terminology, the final layer token level um, hidden states. In this terminology, this would be the final layer patch level um, hidden states. And so now you can think about all the different tasks you might want to do in, uh, on images rather than on text. So we discussed ImageNet, right, which is just image classification can I predict cat out of one of the thousand um, image uh, classes in this data set? So let's say I have a setup like this. How might I um, turn this into a classification problem so now that I have these vectors, I can use them to predict cat out of uh, some finite set of labels? Like what might I do? Yeah, so I need to have a softmax layer that projects something into a thousand classes and then makes it into a probability distribution. But right now I have the sequence of vectors, right? So what do I do before I can feed these into my softmax layer? Yeah, so one choice is I could aggregate them, right? I could average them or do some other function. Uh, but if you think about what happened in BERT, they added a special token, right, a CLS token that implicitly kind of represented this aggregation. And so in this paper, they do the same thing. They just add a special token, this time at the end of the sequence, not at the beginning as in BERT. And uh, this goes through the entire attention computations of the patch level transformer. Finally, you can just put your classifier over this uh, position in the sequence to predict the uh, distribution over the classes. And you can train this on uh, ImageNet. And um, the results are kind of interesting. Um, so basically, they're comparing their model, which is called the Vision Transformer, or VIT. Uh, this is the most popular kind of uh, image encoding model right now. So it is what people prefer to use over convolutional neural networks. Um, but they show that as you increase the size of the training data set, um, only at very large training data sets does the VIT model start to outperform the convolutional ResNet-based um, model. So here, um, just ignore the labels, uh, the legend here. The gray line with the big square represents the largest convolutional ResNet model. So if you train it on ImageNet, which has uh, one million um, uh, training examples, you can see that the ResNet is much better than the, um, the VIT model that's like comparable in size. However, if you move to this data set, which this JFT data set is like Google's internal image classification data set, it has 300 million training examples, not just one million you see a different story. So now the VIT model, which is up here in orange, is slightly outperforming the uh, ResNet, which you can't see, it's uh, kind of at the bottom of this uh, orange dot. And so the authors of this paper, um, they're trying to understand why this is the case. Like why is the transformer worse than the convolutional network on smaller training data sets, but better at very large scales. So does anyone have any ideas why this might be the case? So again, I think this is a, a kind of tricky question and the authors only give a hypothesis as to why this is the case, but 
Really, their argument boils down to the inductive bias of both the convolutional kernel versus the self-attention in the transformer. And so what they're saying is that, you know, if you have a convolutional neural network, the kernels that you have provide some inductive bias already, right? They're small, they encourage the model to learn these low level edges first and then compositions of edges and finally then images. They take advantage of the hierarchical nature of images versus the transformer as we've just seen it here in the vision transformer, it does not have the same inductive bias, right? It, first is doing this weird thing with patches and it has to learn how the different patches relate to each other, but it's not starting from edges or anything like that. Like the convolutional network starts with the raw pixels and then builds a representation up from there. This model is not doing that, right? It's doing something very strange. It starts with patches and then tries to build something out of that, but it's not interpretable, it's not clear what it's doing and um, their hypothesis is that it takes a lot of data for the transformer model to be able to learn specifically how to encode images and take advantage of those low level features in the same way that the convolutional neural network is more naturally able to do even with smaller data sets. Um, like you can make edge detector filters in just by hand specifying the weights of a convolutional kernel. You can't really do that with the transformer, right? It's not clear what, what that even would mean. Um, so that, that's kind of the argument that they make, yeah. Yes, uh, I think this is also related to this YouTube question. What would be the pre-training task before we train on a downstream task? So computer vision um, really has been dominated for the most part by these very large scale supervised uh, tasks. Um, it, it's recently there have been lots of progress, uh, lots of progress in um, uh, contrastive learning for uh, images, as we'll see uh, in a bit with uh, OpenAI's clip, for instance, and. There was a, a paper called SimClear, which showed um, better results on image classification with a self-supervised pre-training step. Um, but uh, these results were first observed in NLP with, for example, even before um, our recurrent neural networks and transformers, we had word de vec which is an example of a self-supervised objective function. Then we had language modeling and mask language modeling, and after that, it became more popular in vision. But um, because in vision, they have these very high quality and large labeled data sets, uh, people tend to gravitate towards those and trying to push up the state of the art in image classification accuracy. So even this, this paper here, they focus primarily on image net classification as the main experiment to show the effectiveness of their model. It is a good question. All right, so uh, let's get to the, the final part here. So we've talked about throughout this entire semester how we can use transformers to encode text and do cool things with text. Um, now we know that we can also use transformers to encode images, right? And the architectures are almost identical, right? For the image, we just have to figure out how do we split up this image into patches and then get some vectors that are kind of the equivalent of token embeddings for the, the model to use. Um, so now that these architectures are kind of the same, is it possible for us to train just one transformer model that can handle both images and uh, text? And so there's been a ton of work on, on this that I'll, I'll go through here. Um, now, before that, I see there's a question. If there is no pre-training, then what are the final layer patch level embeddings being optimized on besides the CLS token? So they are only optimized through the CLS token. There's no token level prediction in this transformer here. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it is different than BERT, right? So in BERT, we also had losses at the token level on all the mask tokens. Here, there's no masking or anything going on. You have the full image. 
you pass it through a transformer encoder, the only objective is on top of the CLS token. The idea is that you just have so much data that you can still learn a very powerful model in this way. All right. So let's start with uh, OpenAI's CLIP model. So many of you might have seen this when it came out. Um, they don't use ImageNet. So their goal is to learn a shared representation space for both text and images. And to do this, they take 400 million pairs of images along with like the alt text or any caption about that image. Uh, they scrape it from the internet. So they have this huge data set now of images and descriptions of those. Like most of them are descriptions of the images. Sometimes, of course, it's not, not really uh, related or it might be something entirely uh, outside the content of the image. Um, but they probably did, did some filtering on that as well. Next, they train two different encoders. So in this clip model, they still have an image encoder and a text encoder. Um, but so basically, they have one vector that comes out of the image encoder. They have another vector that comes out of the text encoder. So um, you know, for BERT, we've talked about how it's easy to get a representation for some input text. right? You can just take the CLS final layer embedding. Similarly, for um, this kind of model, you can just take this vector and use it as a representation of the semantic content of the image. So let's say you have these two vectors. Now, they have a simple contrastive loss. Um, so we can uh, see what this means on this slide. So here you have this uh, picture of this dog, and then the corresponding, um, say, text description, Pepper the Aussie Pup. And so now I'm going to encode like a big batch of images as well as their corresponding captions. So here, let's say it had n different images and n different um, captions. So I'm going to encode each into a vector. So the image vectors are i1, i2, i3. The text vectors are t1, t2, t3. And now I'm going to compute the dot product of every image vector with every text vector in this batch. And so then I can form this matrix that contains all of the dot products. Now, what they do is they want to maximize the dot product between um, an image's vector and its corresponding text vector. So I1 and T1 is basically the vector associated with this picture of the dog. Um, the dot product of that vector with the dot product of the representation of Pepper the Aussie pup. So this we want to maximize, and I1 with T2, so maybe we had another um, caption that was like, you know, students open their books. So we want to minimize the dot product between this image and any caption that is unrelated to that image. Yeah? So remember that these i1, i2, i3, and t1, t2, t3, they are going to be vectors of the same dimension. And there's just going to be one vector for this image and one vector for this text. So before you get to these vectors, you have to have some way of obtaining a single vector from that uh, image encoder. So uh, that's why I suggested here, if you had this model that is trained on image uh, classification, you can just take the CLS token of the image and say that's my one vector for the image. Similarly for text, I can take the BERT CLS token for, you know, if I give it uh, Pepper the Aussie pup and just take the CLS vector for that. So now I have two vectors and I can take the dot product. Yeah. Ah, that's a good question. So they don't do that. Um, so it could be the case that I have another caption here that's like, you know, Pepper the Golden Retriever pup, right? Which is very similar to this one, although it's still not correct, right? I, I could even have a caption, let's say for sake of example, dog sitting on grass, right? Which would be totally appropriate here. But yet, this objective would minimize that in favor of, of this one. So 
So the idea is that you pick, let's say, 16 different images, and you know the caption associated with each of those 16 images. So any other text description in the batch is going to be one associated with a different image. Um, so that's the way they do this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not actually sure what the loss function is doing. I suspect that there is some normalization such that they can apply the, um, but it might be like a margin-based uh, objective as well. So they could say, you know, I want to increase this and decrease this subject to some margin. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact uh, loss function is, but it, it could be using cosine similarity as well. Um, okay, so back to your question, you can see that's why on the diagonal, these are the terms that are getting maximized because they're the uh, image vector paired with the corresponding caption of that image as on the diagonal here. Um, so one thing that is critical for any application of uh, contrastive learning is the batch size. So as you can see here, the negative um, captions come from other images in the batch. So if I only had like a batch size of two, then I would have one negative example for each image in the batch. But if I had a batch size of 1,000, now I have 999 negative examples. So essentially, the model has to learn to prefer the correct caption over 999 different um, candidates, right? So this is a much more challenging problem than just uh, picking one out of two. So in contrastive learning, it is the batch size is like the most important hyperparameter. The bigger the batch size, the better the quality of the representations that you get. Of course, the batch size is bounded by your compute resources, right? How much can you fit on your GPU? All right, so um, now they show that even though this clip model is not trained on ImageNet, right, it's trained with a completely, like, uh, essentially self-supervised uh, objective. Um, I mean, the, it's tricky that if you want to call this self-supervised or not. They have such a huge data set, but still, it requires people to, you know, write captions of corresponding images. That's not an infinite uh, resource. But still, it's not like uh, they're training it on ImageNet. They find that this model is very capable of doing image classification, despite the fact that it's not trained at all for this task. So the way you can use it for image classification is first, you just make your own set of labels. So here, they just use the same labels as an ImageNet. So I have a label like plane, car, dog, bird, blah, 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 a thousand different um, labels like this. And now I can feed that into my text encoder, each one of these labels, just like the single word. I can feed it into, say, BERT and get the CLS token of that word. Now I have 1,000 different text vectors. So now, when I get a new image and I want to classify it into one of these 1,000 labels, I can just take the dot product between that image's vector and the, with each of the 1,000 different label vectors that I've made. Um, and then I can just take the highest one, which in this case is associated with the label dog, uh, and say that's my prediction. So this is a kind of uh, weird way of doing image classification, but in their paper they show that it's actually very good. It's competitive with um, ImageNet trained uh, convolutional neural network models. So here you can see these are all pictures of bananas. Um, some of them are a little more complicated. They have other fruits in them. Um, and the CLIP model is doing very well at uh, classifying these images compared to a uh, model trained on just ImageNet. There are more challenging categories as well. Like look at these bananas, right? If you can see these, they're more like artistic renderings of bananas, right? This is like a draw, a cartoon version of a banana. Um, so if you just train on ImageNet, which consists mainly of photos that people have taken, uh, you're not doing well at recognizing bananas that are drawn in all sorts of different styles. 
Whereas this clip model, because it's trained on just arbitrary images from the internet, many of which are probably not natural images, but uh, like drawings or uh, stylized images, it is able to distinguish all of these, uh, at least at like 89% accuracy correctly. Um, you can also see here, the banana is kind of a smaller part of the image. Um, the background kind of dominates here. Here it's kind of, you know, the, the background, this rug or tablecloth or whatever is kind of also uh, complicate, has a complicated pattern. Um, and you can see here with these black and white sketches of bananas. Uh, and finally, these are like adversarial images meant to fool the existing um, ImageNet classifier. So you can see here, this is a cut up banana on a plate. Um, I don't know how this fools, uh, uh, I guess it's someone holding a banana in some angle where you can't see the curve, I guess. Um, anyway, this, this model is pretty robust to these adversarially constructed uh, images of bananas. So um, essentially this shows the power of just training over a huge amount of data, which uh, of course OpenAI is no, no stranger to doing that. Okay, but there are other ways of, um, so, so in Clip we have two different encoders, one for the image and one for the text. But there are many other approaches that just use one encoder for both the image and the text. And this now is turning into the dominant way of um, modeling both modalities. So here, the SIM VLM paper, they're basically just, uh, if you take a clip-like data set, they want to generate the text of the, uh, the caption um, given the image and some prefix. So here, they take an image, they segment it into patches like all of these methods now do. They have a representation for each patch. Um, they have some position embeddings for the image side. And then they have some prefix, two brown and white dogs. And they feed this into a transformer decoder, um, which is going to just complete the caption here. Two brown and white dogs running happily on a jerk road. So the idea is that this decoder could only generate the caption of the image if it understood the content of the image, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't know what the two dogs were doing. So this is an instance where both the image and the text representations are fed into the exact same transformer. So the transformer has to learn how to incorporate patch embeddings with token embeddings, and that's, that's quite interesting. Um, and it seems like the encoders actually can do this very well, especially if they're very large and pre-trained on text. Um, okay, so there's other approaches. This one is called Visual GPT. Um, essentially, it just has one decoder, so it's a decoder-only language model, um, and it has cross-attention over uh, image encodings. So it's going to be predicting the next word. So here, a cop on brown horse on sidewalk next to truck. But basically, its predictions are attending, the, the model is attending over patch representations from the image. So it's, it's very similar to this one, except instead of explicitly modeling these in a shared encoder, it's just a decoder that does cross attention over some um, external visual uh, transformer. Uh, people have tried this for BERT too, this kind of approach. So here there is a, a model called Vilbert, which um, kind of just has these patch representations and has these uh, image tokens for the caption. Uh, it can mask out some of the patch representations or some of the, the image representations and then try and predict them. Um, so it's really nothing too creative. They're just applying mask language modeling to this sequence that's kind of a hybrid of uh, patch tokens and um, text tokens. So finally, I wanted to talk about what's happening now, because um, many of you have probably seen these generative image models like stable diffusion or mid-journey, and um, all of these kinds of things are using similar types of models. Uh, the main, um, you know, the thing that actually makes them work is really just scale, right? The same thing that we've seen that makes uh, transformer language models so powerful. 
like GPT-4, for example. Um, and this data set here, uh, this Leon 5B, contains 5 billion image text pairs. So CLIP was trained on 400 million image text pairs. This is an open source data set of uh, 5 billion of these images. Yeah, sorry, image and text pairs. And their data construction process is very interesting. So they take the common crawl and they basically like filter out all the websites that have some image and corresponding caption or alt text or whatever. They extract those from the common crawl. Uh, then they do some sort of content filtering to remove like junk um, captions or junk images or duplicates or whatever and they store the data. So this is an interesting way of using the common crawl which we've seen in the past has been used to train giant language models. It turns out that the common crawl also contains images, right? Um, it contains links to images uh, and you can use it for this purpose as well. So they mined these image text pairs from the common crawl and put them online and stable diffusion and related companies uh, trained on, on this. Uh, sorry, what the company is like stability AI or something. They trained on this and um, with bigger and bigger models, you observe uh, increased like image generation quality. Of course, this does not come without issues, right? Because if you have five billion of these images, it's natural to ask where are they coming from, right? And who who created these images? And is it okay for a company to train a giant model on these images and then put out a product and and make money uh, potentially off of it? Um, so it turns out there are major copyright issues. Uh, Stable Diffusion and many other of these uh, image generating products are being sued um, now for making money potentially off of uh, this training data set. So this is actually the text from the lawsuit. Uh, Stable Diffusion and other image generating AI products could not exist without the work of painters, illustrators, photographers, sculptors, and other artists. Stable Diffusion was trained on the Lion 50 or 5B dataset, which contains 5.8 billion image text pairs. Most of the images contained in this dataset are copyrighted, and Lion claims no ownership in them. So on January 13th of this year, there was a lawsuit filed against uh, Stability AI, Midjourney, and so on, alleging copyright infringement. So it seeks damages and injunctive relief to compensate the class for harms already incurred and to prevent future harms. We've already seen um, many company, uh, many image hosting companies um, like file similar lawsuits and try and remove their images from this, this data set or prevent people from training on them. So this is going to keep happening. Uh, it's unclear what the outcome of this is going to be because you know, as we know, it is critical for all of these kinds of technologies, whether it be image or text or image and text, to have as much data as possible, right? We talked about the chinchilla scaling law, right, which suggests that the optimal uh, number of data points for some fixed size model is actually much larger than people thought before and it requires us to get more and more data. Um, so it it's like where are you going to get this data and what should happen to the people like as they say the painters the illustrators and so on who created most of the data right they they didn't intend for it to be used in this way um so yeah it's it's quite uh interesting to see what will happen here and uh similarly to this uh we see that reddit is also jumping on um because of course a lot of the data that mo OpenAI's models and Google's models are trained on comes from Reddit, right? It's a great source of uh, QA pairs or um, other kinds of more topical advice. Um, and so Reddit had made APIs available so anyone could scrape Reddit and create their own data set, and you could do this for free. Um, but it turns out that after seeing the success of models like ChatGPT, they are also considering, you know, this is not the original intent of uh, Reddit, right? Is to be used as training data for a large language model. Um, so what can they do to, you know, 
Um, I, it's not clear. It seems like they just want to make money off of this because their solution seems to be to now charge for the API instead of have it for free. Um, but I do wonder, like a Reddit user who puts a lot of time and effort into their posts, uh, should they be, you know, compensated somehow? And that opens up a huge can of worms, right? Uh, obviously, these companies are training on huge amounts of copyrighted text already, like published books and so on. Um, what happens there? Not really clear now that this technology is already released and people know how powerful it is that um, you know they can say, oh, just remove all the copyrighted data and retrain your system. It, it might be significantly worse as a result. So um, yeah, not, not sure what's going to happen with that. So finally, I wanted to talk about this uh, new model uh, very recently released by Google called Palm E. Um, so we briefly mentioned Palm before as like Google's giant language model. Um, Palm E is actually a multimodal language model. So similarly to some of the approaches we've discussed before, they have a single language model, like a transformer architecture, and they just feed it sequences that are made up of both uh, image representations, text representations, and potentially uh, representations from different uh, modalities as well. So they have a very interesting um, demo. Okay, glad this one loaded. Um, so they, you can see that the original POM model is 540 billion parameters, and they're using a vision transformer, which is 22 billion parameters. So uh, computer vision models have not scaled up to the same extent that um, NLP models have. The 22 billion VIT is actually the largest one available for um, computer vision. It's actually not trivial to scale these things uh, for images. There are several interesting papers um, written about this. But they show that this model, even though it's, it's really just following the same kind of um, uh, pat, uh, strategy that we talked about before of integrating the image and text into one sequence and uh, predicting the next word. Um, it can do all sorts of things like uh, manipulate robots. So this one, it says, bring the rice chips from the draw, jar. And so this robot here is being guided by the Palm E um, model. It opens the drawer. It takes the, oh, there's an adversarial disturbance. I'm <laughs> interesting. It grabs the chips. Oh, oh, that's the disturbance. OK, that's annoying. Wow, that's quite a few adversarial disturbances. <laughs> All right, and I guess it succeeds here. Um, so again, this is just a single model that is uh, able to like you know guide this robot using the output of a camera, right? Uh, that can be encoded into image embeddings, and using text uh, from the instructions here, which can be embedded using the model. Um, there's also other interesting examples. So if you click this um, this picture here, you can do. Uh, I'll zoom in here. You can do. Um, quite complicated visual QA. So here, you're given this image. So this is just the representation of the image. Who are the two teams playing in this photo? Which was the last to win a championship? Which year did they win? And who was their star player? And then they put in this uh, you know, prompt to make the model like output its reasoning. Um, it says a team in white is in New York. Is New York Nick? OK, not very grammatical. Team in green is Boston Celtic, also not great. Um, I am not sure if this is correct. I am not a basketball fan. I just Google. Wow, I don't think they read these <laughs> outputs on their demo. Um, this is not even a question that was, uh, yeah. OK, anyway, um, maybe they have a better one. Let me click another. All right, what flavor is the pink donut on the right? Um, what, oh, oh, wait, what? Oh, it generated another question. 
Yeah, clearly they did not do any sort of uh, uh, reading of their own demo examples. <laughs> Although I guess this is true. The donut on the left is blueberry. Um, what will the robot do next fall? Okay, that seems reasonable. Uh, all right. Um, okay, you have this image here of many animals stacked up. Uh, description, a cow sitting on a rug. Jo oh, so it's supposed to create a joke out of this image. All right, let's see what it did. A donkey is carrying a dog, cat, and rooster. Joke, what do you call a donkey with a rooster on his back? A rooster booster. All right. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so this is asking for some more complicated reasoning over, I guess these are three different pictures from someone's day, uh, 10.30 a.m. So you can see where they have these bolded image one, image two, image three, they're just inserting the image representation of the corresponding image into the sequence. So they have like this uh, text sequence that's mostly text except for these image embeddings. I forget, what did I have for lunch? Um, you had sandwich two, for you had a sandwich for lunch, it was 12.45 p.m. Um, so yeah, I think we'll see a lot more models like this. Uh, GPT-4 has purportedly some sort of capability like this too, although it hasn't been released yet. Um, but um, yeah, probably by next time I teach this class, there will be better uh, models and demos that, that um, yeah, we can, we can use from just these single model multiple modality training runs. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so the question is, will CNNs become completely obsolete? I'm not sure. I think still for like smaller data settings, they are better than the visual transformers. Um, but yeah, for these large scale uh, training runs, I think, because transformers just scale a lot better than any other kind of model, people have been using them for, uh, for these kinds of tasks, and clearly they figured out how to make them scale and improve over CNN. So until something else comes along, that maybe people will find ways to you know, make a CNN better than a transformer again, but um, right now it seems that way. Um, yeah, uh, so you mean in this case, for clip, there's two encoders? Uh, oh, uh, no, so stable diffusion is generating images. So I didn't talk about that because it is a little more complicated. Uh, if you're generating an image, then uh, and you're doing, you're using one of these setups where, let's say you're using a transformer decoder to generate an image, you're not going to do this pixel by pixel because that's just uh, horribly inefficient, right, and doesn't scale well. Um, so what really happens is they take a collection of images and they compute a vocabulary over those images. Um, this is using techniques like uh, VQ, VAE, basically they quantize the um, images into a small, finite vocabulary of, uh, like small patches, you can think of it. Like, uh, so these are discrete tokens. And then you can generate a sequence of these, um, these tokens to generate a full image. Um, but there's also things like diffusion models, which are, um, you know, an, outside the scope of this, this class. Um, so all of these kinds of open source models, I think, are using different, um, I'm not sure what the latest like mid-journey is, is using. 
probably some people here know, know better than, than I do. But uh, yeah, we, we didn't talk about how you actually go about doing that. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, I guess we're out of time. So uh, yeah, that's the last lecture of the semester. Your final project reports are due tonight. Um, so please submit those. And we'll probably take like one and a half to two weeks to complete grading of everything that's uh, do, um, have been turned in so far that hasn't yet been graded. We did respond to all of the regrade requests for the exam. There's still some for homework one that um, we have yet to respond to. but. Yeah, I'll send uh, emails and make Piazza posts as the grades are posted so you can check those. So have a good summer break. Thank you. Yeah.